Okay. Well, sorry about that. Um, so before I start talking about Hobbes, are there questions about the course or anything like that? Assignments? Okay. So, uh, yeah, I'll say a tiny bit about Hobbes himself, very tiny, and then I'll start talking about the book. So, better if those slides go on. It's weird because I had to turn put it down. All right. Okay. Sixteen seventy nine. He lived to be ninety one years old. <laughs> um, but uh, um, but his important period was earlier than that. Um, so he actually is, I think, probably a more important figure in the history of. Um, early modern philosophy than we tend to realize. Um, in part, maybe because he's not one of the big three empiricists or one of the big three rationalists. <laughs> um, but he actually wrote about a lot of stuff, a lot, a lot of stuff about physics and optics and mathematics, um, uh, which I haven't read very much of, but it seems like it might be important. However, <laughs> the most important thing or most famous thing he did was write this book, Leviathan, which was published in 1651. Um, uh, and uh, so just after the end of the English Civil War, as I said before. Um, so Hobbes, as I think will become obvious as you read the book, if it's not obvious already, Hobbes was a royalist, right? That is, he was on the king's side in the Civil War. Um, and uh, he spent the war mostly in Paris. Um, however, ironically, when Leviathan was published, um, the anti-religious content of it, and especially the anti-religious authority content of it, um, made the other royalists in Paris, not to mention the French Catholics, so angry at him that he had to flee back to England for his safety. <laughs> so, um, he actually ended up in England, back in England during the Commonwealth and the Protectorate. Um, um, I said is a tiny bit. That's all I'm going to say about him. <laughs> um, I do know a few other things, not as much as I should, unless there are questions. Okay, he wrote. <laughs> he got. He was in a controversy for decades with John Wallace, who was one of Locke's teachers at Oxford. Uh, who was a mathematician. Something about squaring the circle. I think Hobbes on the side of claiming that there was a way of squaring a circle. And uh, so Hobbes was, was wrong, but his deck, this like feud persisted for decades. And I think the title of one of the books he wrote was um, On the Mathematical Demonstrations, Country Language, and Barbarisms of John Wallace. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> right, but so. Uh, back to this book. Um, yeah, so I mean, one thing about this book, since it was written such a long time ago, the meaning of words has changed somewhat since then. Um, and so you might want to be careful about that. And um, conveniently, in this edition, there's a glossary. 
in the back. Um, and there's words in the test text with little asterisks next to them. That means that it's in the glossary. So, um, like for example, here I see the word propriety, and there's an asterisk next to it because Hobbes used the word propriety to mean property, as well as what we mean by propriety. I mean they're really the same word, basically, but he uses propriety for both. Um, so that's just an example. Um, okay. Um, so I'm going to first discuss something about the overall plan of the book. Um, and then I'm going to talk about two or maybe three things that are especially important in this reading. So the first reading. So the um, two things are, first of all, Hobbes's metaphysics and epistemology. Right, if you remember that list I drew last time, metaphysics and epistemology shows it goes on the theoretical side, as opposed to politics, which goes on the practical side. Um, but as I also said last time, those, you know, those things are always connected to each other. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, you might find it surprising if you're familiar with philosophy mostly the way it is now, which is very hyper-specialized. That's, that's really happened in the last, I don't know, 40 years, 50 years, something like that. Um, before that time, there was practically no one in the history of philosophy who was well known for like, just one subfield and not others. And so Hobbes is no exception. Like I said, he wrote, you know, his first book was on motion, de motu. He wrote some, some of his works were in Latin and others were in English. Um, and he, you know, he clearly has opinions about these things that are important to understand other things he's saying in this book which mostly come up in this reading. So that's one thing I want to discuss. And the other thing is the, I guess, definitions and discussion of will and power, which um, are going to be, for obvious reasons, very, well, at least I hope it's obvious, are going to be very important in the rest of the book. Right? It's, it's going to always be important to remember what Hobbes actually means when he talks about will and when he talks about power. Um, and the third thing, if there's time, is to start talking about, um, well, I guess you could say Hobbes' theology. Um, Hobbes was notorious for being an atheist. <laughs> um, uh, the book doesn't say I'm an atheist, I uh, believe in God, right? The, on the contrary, like the first line of the book after the dedication is um, nature, parentheses, the art whereby God hath made and governs the world is by the art of man as in many other things, so in this also imitated, etc. right? And so he talks about God a lot in this book. Um, how is that consistent with him having this reputation as a notorious atheist. So um, like I said, I might, I'll start talking about that if I have time at the end. If not, it's going to come up again lots of times. Okay, but like I said, first I want to talk about the overall plan of the book. So, um, so the introduction um, basically explains why the book is arranged the way it is. And it starts with a comparison or, I mean, it seems like actually, according to Hobbes, this is not just a metaphor, but this is literally the case, that a commonwealth is a living thing. I'm not sure. It's not. It's not 100 clear whether it's a metaphor or whether it's literal. But um, 
But in any case, uh, it's either is a living thing or is very similar to a living thing. Now, uh, why would you say that? Where, well, he explains, this is the second sentence of the introduction. For seeing life is but a motion of limbs, the beginning whereof is in some principal part within. So, um, so what we mean, according to Hobbes, when we say something is alive, is that it has some principal part within. What is the principal part? Well, in a natural animal, that is what we usually call an animal, right? An animal created by nature, as opposed to an artificial animal. In a natural animal, basically the principal part is the brain. But, um, but it doesn't, from Hobbes' point of view, for this definition, it doesn't matter what the principal part is. You might think it's the heart, like people used to think before Galen or whatever. So anyway, so there's a, a principal part within, and this thing has like limbs. And the motion of the limbs depends on the principal part within. So, um, The be actually, what he says is, life is but a motion of limbs, the beginning whereof is, is in some principal part within, right? So this is something that moves its limbs in a certain way, but the beginning of this motion is always in this principal part, or anyway, at least sometimes in this principal part, right? I guess it isn't always, right? Like if you push this thing over, then it it moves its limbs in a way that doesn't begin in its principal part. But the motions that are characteristic of it as living begin in the principal part, and then they get transmitted out to the limbs somehow, and that's why the limbs move. Um, so, uh, so Hobbes says the commonwealth is an artificial animal, it's an artificial, artificial meaning made by art, made by human beings, right? An artificial thing which uh, moves its limbs in the way where the beginning of the motion is some principal part of them. Um, so the principal part, what's the principal part within the commonwealth? It's what Hobbes calls the sovereign. Right, so like to begin with, at least you can think of the Commonwealth as some kind of blob like this, and within the Commonwealth is the sovereign, and the sovereign is the principal part, and the other parts move, um, but their motion begins with the sovereign. Now, um, one reason I said to begin with, you can think of it this way is, I mean, if you think of this as a literal picture. Um, uh, it wouldn't fit every form of commonwealth. In a monarchy, according to Hobbes, as we'll see, in a monarchy, the sovereign is one person. But there's other forms of commonwealth. So in other forms of commonwealth, the sovereign is an assembly of people. And there's a form of commonwealth that Hobbes uh, allows for that he calls democracy, where the sovereign is the assembly of the entire people. Right, so um, so you can't really draw, say, the sovereign is over here, and then outside are all the limbs. Right, it's more abstract. It's the motions of the in a democracy. The motions of the individual people begin with the decisions of the assembly of the whole people. Um, but it's easier to imagine it. And from Hobbes' point of view, this is probably an advantage. It's easier to imagine it if you think of the Commonwealth as a monarchy. Then this 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 is kind of can be a literal picture, right? There's one person somewhere inside the Commonwealth, and from that person stretch something that make the other parts move. Um, so, and that's why the book is called Leviathan because the Commonwealth is a great big animal. Like, right, Leviathan is this biblical sea monster. 
So uh, the Commonwealth is this great big animal, a leviathan. Um, however, it's actually supposed to be more like a human being than it is like a fish. Right, so he says, um, um, art goes yet further, imitating that rational and most excellent work of nature, man. For by art is created that great Leviathan called a commonwealth or state in Latin civitas, right? Those are all the words I was talking about last time, which is but an artificial man, though of greater strength and strength, and stature and strength than the natural. So why, why is this thing more like a human being than like a fish? Well, because it has reason. Um, so in this big artificial, I'm going to say artificial human being. Hobbes says man. Um, I guess I should say something about, at least something about that right now. That, you know, as I said before, these authors all say man at times when they don't mean man as opposed to woman. Um, let alone other genders or whatever that I don't think they're thinking about. <laughs> um, but they also sometimes say man, and they do mean man as opposed to woman. <laughs> um, and the English word man has that double edged character. It, it didn't just get that now, it has that in the 17th century too. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I guess to some extent it's lost it now, right? Like now, if you say man, people are like, well, what about women? <laughs> But in the 17th century, uh, you know, you could use it that way, but there was always the possibility that you meant it the other way. So if people have had me in courses before, I probably have heard this story before, but um, I used to know someone who was really into Tolkien, but his English wasn't really good, and he had only read Tolkien in Hebrew. <laughs> And so, you know, there's that story about like the, I don't know if you know Tolkien or not, but there's that story that's like a prophecy about the Lord of the Nazgul, no man will destroy him. And in the end, he's killed by a woman and, and a hobbit. <laughs> um, so uh, it's the, the woman part is uh, what I want to focus on. So, um, so this guy I knew um, uh, didn't get the, solution to the riddle, right? Like in English, we understand when we first read it, no man will destroy him. We think, oh, no one will destroy him, right? But then you get to the end, it's, oh, it's a woman. Oh, so they meant man, right? So, but like when they translated it, they had to choose between a word that definitely could mean either a man or a woman and a word that definitely had to mean a man and not a woman. And I don't know which they chose, but, um, um, so it was impossible to reproduce that riddle with its solution, right? So the, so, so the English word man has this dangerous character to it from the beginning. Um, and uh, um, so therefore it's like, it's tricky what to do when they say man, I wanna always change it. Like when I read it back to say human, but you need to be careful because sometimes they don't mean that. <laughs> Right, so, um, and, uh, you know, I actually in the Latin translation of Leviathan, which was published much later, Hobbes had to decide when um, man was going to be translated uh, as homo and when it was going to be translated as veer, right? Like he had to decide when it was going to be, when it meant human and when it meant man as opposed to woman. Sometimes you can like you can look in the Latin translation and see things that kind of get hidden in English that he had to he was he was unable to conceal them. <laughs> um, but anyway, so that's all I'm going to say about that for now. Um, it's like I said, it's going to come up with all these authors, including Mary Wilsoncraft, who also usually says man when she means human being. Um, but as I said, sometimes. You know, she's the only one I think who sometimes puts in, or women. <laughs>
Um, all right. Um, okay, so getting back to this. Um, so, uh, so this artificial human being has, Hobbes says it has an artificial soul. What does that mean? Like, how do we give, how do we make a soul? That, like, what could we have done that made a soul? So it only makes sense if you understand what Hobbes thinks the soul in a natural animal is. Like, so you might think the soul in a natural animal is a kind of like mysterious, immaterial thing that's connected to this body and moves it. Uh, like, for example, if you were Descartes, you would, well, actually, you wouldn't, if you were Descartes, you wouldn't think that about non human animals, but you would think that about human beings, right? But they have a body and a soul. These are two different things that are connected in some weird way. Um, but Hobbes, um, which is one of the first things I'm going to talk about when we get to here, doesn't think that we have any ideas, of, that we have any conception of things that are not bodies. So he doesn't think it even makes sense to talk about some thing that's not a body, that's connected to a body. Right? He thinks that's just nonsense. We're using words without meaning when we say that. So what does he think the soul is? And so basically the soul is um, the characteristic of this body that makes it the case that the motion of the limbs depends on this principal part with them. So in the case of the natural animal, you could say the soul is like the organization of the animal having, you know, it's having nerves and muscles and bones set up in such a way that a small motion in here can be amplified into a big motion of the limbs out here. So, right, so it's not a thing, it's like a principle, it's like a arrangement. <laughs> yeah. Um, in Christianity, is like God and Jesus um, kind of the same relationship in this sense? And that <laughs> kind of like creates the soul in, in that relationship? Uh, that's some kind of heresy, but, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, but I don't, I don't, I don't want to try to explain what the actual relationship between the persons in the Trinity is or whatever. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, I mean, Hobbes has his own, uh, like, um, I think that's in one of the assigned readings where he explains what he thinks it means that, that there's three persons of God. It, it's uh, not at all uh, orthodox what he thinks it means. But anyway, yeah, that's something else. Forget about that. <laughs> so, but I mean, here we're just talking about, so in other words, so similarly, one can make an automaton like a clock. That's another example that Hawes discusses right there in the first paragraph. We, when we set it up in such a way that the motions of the parts depend on this, you know, this, the spring within or whatever, um, that is giving it a soul because we've the soul is it's being set up in that way such that the motion of the spring within is transmitted to the motion of the hands right so um, so similarly Hobbes says that in the commonwealth the sovereignty is an artificial soul as giving life and motion to the whole body so I think he's using the, the term carefully here. The sovereign is like the brain. The sovereignty, <laughs> that is the fact of there being a sovereign is like a soul. Right, so the soul of the commonwealth is the fact that it's ruled by a sovereign. And, um, Um, and the Commonwealth has something like nerves, what are the nerves? So he says, reward and punishment by which fastened to the seat of the sovereignty, 
every joint, right? So the seat of the sovereignty is like the seat of the soul. The brain is the seat of the soul, and the sovereign is the seat of the sovereignty. <laughs> right? So um, reward and punishment, by which fastened to the seat of the sovereignty, every joint and member is moved to perform his duty, are the nerves. So the nerves, and we're talking about motor nerves here, right? Not sensory nerves. He, he discusses what's equivalent to sensation here too, but um, the nerves are reward and punishment. So in other words, in an animal, how, how is it that the limbs are moved by motions within the brain? Well, at least, you know, according to 17th century mechanism, it must somehow be by, by like pulling things, pulling each other. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, I mean, it might be much more complicated, maybe like some little bodies flow through the nerve and whatever, but ultimately it's because like, somehow motions here push something here which pushes something here and pushes something here and like pushes something here and interlocks with something here and that makes the, the leg move that's how it works in a natural animal how what makes some individual member of the commonwealth move due to the will of the sovereign well um they're not, the individual members of the Commonwealth are not literally in chains, right? There aren't, there isn't something that literally fastens them to the sovereign, so the sovereign can pull on it and make them move. How does the sovereign make them move? The sovereign makes them move by proposing rewards and punishments for doing various things. Um, and because Unlike the limbs of this natural animal, the individuals that make up the commonwealth are rational themselves. Their motion can be controlled by um, announcing rewards and punishments. So the reward and punishment. So again, so you know you can draw it this way, but it's it's really the nerve here is kind of an abstract thing. It's the fact that rewards and punishments. Um, depend on the will of the sovereign. Professor that makes all the limbs move the way Professor. the sovereign wants them to. Can you hear me? I think someone's trying to ask you a question. Oh, yes, yeah. on Zoom. Yeah, Professor. Yes. So, so it's what you're saying is that with the sovereign acting as the brain, yeah, um, uh, of a body basically that the, the state in general responds to the will of the sovereign as the body responds to the messages of the brain. And you have that, what I think you kind of drew up there is kind of like a nerve ending, but that nerve ending can be broken and a limb can react differently than what the brain would like it to at, at some point, like as in revolution or something of that nature. Yeah, and, and, uh, and the commonwealth can die, right? Not only can one, limb fail to respond the right way but so at the end of this list of you know he has a whole list the reward and punishments of the nerves the uh, wealth and riches of the particular members of the strength etc cetera, etc cetera. and then he says sedition is sickness right so sedition means like rebellion or whatever is sickness and civil war is death Right, so at the point where, uh, so when the limbs aren't responding the way they should because something's wrong, that's just like in the case of a natural animal, when it's sick, its parts don't function properly. They don't respond properly to the principal part within. And when it comes to the point where the, the people who were members of the Commonwealth are now on opposite sides and are fighting each other, the Commonwealth is no longer exists, it's dead. Um, um, and I guess, yeah, it is important to keep in mind from the beginning that Hobbes um, doesn't think that Commonwealths uh, are ever so perfect that they're immortal. Um, eventually something will go wrong. 
Um, yeah, so that was a good question. Whoever was that asked that from computer land. Um, so, um, so in order to make this artificial animal then, and this is where I'm getting to the overall structure of the book, in order to make this artificial animal, we have to um, replicate what nature or God does in making a natural animal. So what is that? So Hobbes says, well, um, we have to impose the form of the commonwealth on the matter, which it's going to be made up of. So this is like Aristotelian terminology, you know, like when um, an animal is born, the, you know, like when a mouse is born, the form of mouse enters into some matter and that's what makes it into a mouse. Um, that can be interpreted in different ways. I, I, I think I already told you like how Hobbes is gonna interpret that. The, the form is just gonna consist of arranging bodies in the right way. <laughs> that when they push against each other, the things you want will happen, right? So that's what nature or God does when it makes a natural animal. So in the case of the commonwealth, we're gonna, the matter of the commonwealth is gonna be all the individuals who make it up or its subjects. And the form is gonna be the way we have to arrange them to make it the case that their motion depends on the will of the sovereign. Um, so making a, co a commonwealth means like bringing that arrangement into existence. Um, and so, I mean, that's why, first of all, the full title of the book, uh, the full title of the book. Oh. oh, here we go. This is the original, this is the famous original frontispiece pieces. Book, right, where you see this huge guy made out of little people. <laughs> That's the Commonwealth. <laughs> but yeah, so the full title is Leviathan or the Matter, Form, and Power of a Commonwealth, Ecclesiastical and Civil. Um, so, right, so, so the first part of the book is going to be about the matter. Or actually, he says, first, the matter thereof and the artificer, both of which is man. Right? So the matter, the commonwealth is going to be made out of, and also the person who's going to make a commonwealth out of that matter is human beings. So part one is about human nature. Um, and then secondly, how and by what covenants it is made? What are the rights and just power or authority of a sovereign? and what it is that preserveth and dissolveth it, right? So the second part is about now, how do you put these things together and how do they function properly and what makes them malfunction? So it's about the form of commonwealth, the imposition of the form and as we were just discussing, the problems that come up, that, that can come up with the, the form not being properly, I guess, uh, embodied by the matter. I don't know how, what the word to use for that. Um, then there's two more parts. So most of the re most of what we're going to be reading is from part one and part two. The part one is about human nature and part two is about the structure and functioning of the commonwealth. Um, part three is, you might expect a little bit less, but I mean, it's referred to in that long title of commonwealth ecclesiastical and Civil, I think is what it says. Because um, the third part is about what is a Christian commonwealth? So why is that third part there? Um, well, to understand why it's there, I think you have to remember that the English Civil War, like a lot of wars that were happening at this period on the continent too. Do you have a question or are you? No, I'm oh, okay. sorry. All right. So um, like a lot of wars that are happening on the continent now too was in part a religious war. Um, and the people who defeated the king and overthrew him and executed him did it in, like in the name of religion. 
and they um, they looked on themselves as being like Old Testament prophets, right? So that so right. So the, the Bible records prophets, you know, making people king, then taking the kingship away from them and giving it to someone else, um, just like what. Um, actually, Hobbes likes to loves to point out this similarity, just like what the Pope claims to be able to do. <laughs> right. So, in other words, these radical Protestants and the and the Catholics are the same in this respect, that um, they think that religion gives them an authority which you know puts them over kings. So basically, the point of the whole third part is to head off any claim that Christianity somehow changes this by giving someone uh, an authority that's above the authority of the sovereign. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, a lot of part three is biblical interpretation. <laughs> that's part of the reason we won't be reading very much of it because it's interesting, but it's like, uh, it's involved in all these obscure points of biblical interpretation. Hobbes' interpretation of the Bible is very strange. <laughs> um, but, uh, so in any case, so we really some of that, and also the fourth part. So the fourth part is, what is the kingdom of darkness? Which uh, to continue the Tolkien theme sounds like it might be about Mordor or something, <laughs> but it's actually about it's about the human deceivers who obscure the kind of truth that Hobbes is trying to put forward here, and like what their motives are, and you know what can be done about them. That's the kingdom of darkness. So we'll read a little bit of that too. Um, okay, so that's a general introduction to how the book is put together. Are there questions about that? Okay, so, um, so part one, which is about human nature, um, um, so it basically has it basically has three parts. The third part is something I discussed. It doesn't correspond to these three points. I know it's confusing. But it basically has three parts. The third part is about the pre-political state of human society, right? With the famous state of nature. So the right, so the, the third part, what I'm calling the third part of part one is going to be about what human beings were like before there was a commonwealth or what they're like now whenever there is no commonwealth more accurately so um well it's kind of both i'm gonna i'm not gonna talk about that till next time anyway. so i'm gonna talk about that next time but the first two parts are first of all um the part where Hobbes discusses his general metaphysics and epistemology. And then, um, and as part of that, he also um, says some initial th metaphysical things about God. Um, and uh, then after that, there's a discussion of the psychology of the will and the passions, right? So that's where this stuff is going to be. Um, Right, so this just this is like just the general background that you need to understand everything he's going to say, and then this is getting more into the details of human nature and so far as it's relevant to political issues. So what you know have to know about human beings to know how they can live together in peace is like what their will and passions are. Like. Um, okay. So like I said, I'm going to talk about some of this stuff first. So let me raise this. Maybe I should leave this thing up here. Um, so, um, so Hobbes has two basic metaphysical positions. Um, and I kind of already talked, alluded to both of them, but right. So the first one is materialism, meaning that he thinks everything, or more technically, every substance, is a body. Um, 
So everything is like a little bit too vague because, for example, like um, this is a body. It has, for example, a triangular shape. So its triangular shape is not a body, right? Its triangular shape is like a mode accident of a body. So, you know, that's why I said technically what it, the, the view is that all substances are bodies, meaning all the things that, roughly speaking, all the things that have properties are bodies. And what properties do they have? Well, um, they have the kind of properties that bodies can have. So I'll get to that in a second. But um, but Hobbes thinks um, we can be very certain that this is true. And the reason we can be very certain that it's true is that we don't literally don't understand what it would mean for something, a substance, not to be a body. Right, so it's so if I say, um, you know, there's an incorporeal substance, a substance that's not a body, according to Hobbes, I'm just contradicting myself, and I and I don't mean anything. <laughs> um, right, so this is uh, it says this on chapter three, paragraph twelve. This is on page fifteen. Um, um, no man can have in his mind. Oh no, that's not right. Part. No man, therefore, can conceive anything, but he must conceive it in some place and endued with some determinate magnitude, and which may be divided into parts. Right. So that's as much as to say. Um, no one can conceive anything that's not a body. Um, so that's, uh, I mean, first of all, on a, at least on a certain way of understanding what it means to say that there is a God, they're already admitting that he's an atheist. That's part of the answer to what I said, right? Saying that every substance is a body. Um, uh, but so on this point, Hobbes is saying something that at least very few people will openly say in this period. And he's saying something certainly that's diametrically opposed to what Descartes says. Right, Descartes' famous view is substance dualism, meaning that there's two different kinds of substances, bodies and minds. Um, uh, and um, uh, the kind we understand most clearly and distinctly is minds. <laughs> Whereas Hobbes is saying we have no conception at all of that supposed kind of substance that's not a body. Okay, so that's one. Well, the physical view, and the second one is mechanism, and mechanism, roughly speaking, means that the only kind of properties that bodies have are like body-specific properties, properties that 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 every body must have, right? So size, shape, motion. Um, and possibly something like force. Descartes would leave this out. I'm not quite sure about Hobbes. Actually, there's some point in our reading where it almost it sounds like he wants to add heat and cold to this list. But I can't think he's serious about that. Um, uh, okay, so anyway, so on this point, Hobbes agrees with most people in this period, Galileo, Descartes, uh, Locke, and a lot of other people are mechanists. They think that what bodies really, the properties that bodies really have are these fundamental 
properties that all bodies must have size, shape, motion, and possibly something like force or solidity. Um, and uh, what about all those other properties we think they have, like color? Well, those are really just ways they affect us. So those really exist only subjectively. Now it's, I mean, it's a little hard to reconcile that last point with materialism. <laughs> um, but uh, um, Hobbes doesn't really say enough about this here for me to, to figure out what, um, right? Because so, so like for Descartes, it's easy to understand that. We say color is not really embodied. We mean bodies really just have size, shape, uh, and motion. And um, color is something that exists in a mind, not in a body. And I kind of like, so the body causes me to have this like color sensation in my mind, and I kind of falsely project it onto the body. Right. But if you don't have something, you don't have a mind for that to happen, and then it's a little bit harder to explain what that sensation is. Okay, but that doesn't seem to bother Hobbes. Um, that's a very dangerous thing to say. Maybe you're even supposed to notice for some reason this incoherence. But I don't, I don't, I don't know what to do with that. So I'm going to say that doesn't bother Hobbes. <laughs> um, and it's not very relevant to the rest of this book, so I'm not going to talk about it anymore. Um, but um, the result of this um, is that, um, as Hobbes says, so this is chapter one, paragraph four on page six. Um, the cause of sense is the external body or object which presses the organ proper to each sense, either immediately as in the taste and touch or immediately as in seeing, hearing and smelling, which pressure by the mediation of nerves and other strings and membranes of the body continued inwards to the brain and heart causeth there a resistance or counter pressure or endeavor of the heart to deliver itself, which endeavor because outward seemeth to be some matter without. And this seeming or fancy is that which men call sense. Right, so the way sensation works is that a uh, body outside my body presses against part of my body that's the sense organ either um, immediately, right? That is immediately means with nothing in between or immediately meaning there's a medium, something goes in between. So like it pushes this thing and this thing pushes me. So like it pushes these little light corpuscles and they, you know, travel out to my eye and push my eye and my eye pushes or you know, so act, so according to mechanism, all the way bodies act on each other, if they only have these properties, how can they act on each other? Well, they can act on each other because they can't. So a body is something that takes up a certain space of a certain shape and size, meaning no other body can be in this space. So if this one moves and there's one here, this one will also have to move. That's how bodies move each other by pushing. <laughs> right? So, um, so, but they can also pull each other because you can have like little hooks. That's why I keep doing this type of stuff, right? <laughs> Where it's set up so that you can, by pushing, you can pull. So anyway, so it pushes or pulls against some strings or nerves and the motion continues into the brain or the heart. Actually, so it's weird. Why is he unsure whether it's the brain or the heart? I don't know. Maybe he doesn't always care. But so in any case, it gets to the brain or the heart or wherever. And at that point, there's kind of like a reaction to this motion and pushes back. And he says, that's the sensation. So the sensation is this little motion inside me 
that's caused by the action of the external body on my sense organ mediated by my nerves. Yeah. Um, but taking a metaphor, isn't there also like some ability for bodies to feel what's happening inside themselves? And I feel like that's especially living in the American state. That's something that we sort of, I don't know, I feel like a lot of the news is American. Uh, okay, so first of all, so now I'm not really talking about this, the Commonwealth case, right? Remember, part one is about human nature. So he's talking about natural human beings at this point. But um, although I guess it is supposed to all, you know, there's supposed to be something analogous to it in the case of the Commonwealth. But um, but yeah, I mean, there's uh, inward uh sensations and you can just see from this picture how they can be caused right like something happens here in my body and it pulls some strings and etc um, okay um um and he says thoughts which he also calls imagination, are just the continued internal motion here um, after this has stopped acting. Right? So he says thought is decayed sense. <laughs> right? Like the the this body started some motion in my brain, even after the body stops working, things are still like bouncing around in there. And that is thought or imagination, right? So thought or imagination is kind of like a faded image. Um, that's the way it seems. Again, it's not clear where this is since it's obviously supposed to be in a body, but that's the way it seems. It seems like kind of a faded image. What it is, is a motion that's similar to the original motion that was the sensation, but it's like decayed. <laughs> okay. Um, so, and it must be like that because that's the only way that an external body or an internal body can act on you by, by pushing. By, by causing emotion. That's the only way it can act, and that's the only kind of effect it can have. What it causes in me must be another motion. So therefore, sense is a kind of motion. What is it? It's a kind of motion which started out here, basically. And similarly, um, desire and aversion, because they have the capability of producing motions, that is motions of my limbs must also be motions. Right? So in uh, chapter six, at the beginning of chapter six, he defines divide, desire and aversion, or generally speaking, endeavor. Right? He defines desire and aversion as small motions within that may be amplified into big motions of the limbs. Um, Professor. Yes. So I, I don't want to get ahead of you if this is where we're going, but are you basically telling us that um, from his point of view, this is the basic beginning of power dynamics within a state? from an analogy of the human body uh, and human interaction, uh, 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 forceful interaction of bodies? Well, it's, um, so it's true. Yes, he thinks there's that analogy. Although remember, again, there's a difference in the way it works. Right in a natural animal, it works by literal strings, chains that attach one part to another. Right, I mean, a chain is exactly how you can pull things by pushing. You know, it looks like this. So, like, yeah, so I mean, it works by chains that connect one thing to another. In the case of a commonwealth, it's going to work by what he calls artificial chains, which again are rewards and punishments. 
So, I mean, but yes, there is an analogy, but again, I, um, um, in part one, he's focusing on not so much on the analogy as is on what goes on in the natural case. And, you know, that's important to understand because remember, again, like this commonwealth is to understand how it's analogous to an animal or is an animal, we're going to have to first understand what it's made out of. And what it's made out of is these individual human beings that act in certain ways. And he wants to explain like exactly what it is that makes them act in the way they do. So, and based on his metaphysics that I just outlined, the, the explanation must be they act the way they do because things press on them in certain ways that causes motions within. Eventually it causes a little motion within of a kind we call a desire or an aversion, which is the kind which if nothing interferes will result in a big motion of the limb. And that's what always happens when someone acts voluntarily. There isn't some other process. In there. It's always a motion that starts without, that causes a motion within, that causes another little motion that ca eventually causes this big motion. Yes. So he's saying individually we're driven by our desires and aversions. And so collectively we can be driven by rewards and punishments which produce those desires. Yeah, I mean, that's that's why desires and aversions are so important to him. Yes, but like, yeah, I'm, I'm starting to like, was it a mistake to to develop this analogy so much at the beginning? I don't know. Um, uh, I mean, yes, we are heading for the way this the, the things that are set up this way, like what they're how they're going to act. Um, I mean, it's you know, it's going to be important that. Um, so if we tried to make a commonwealth out of like squirrels or something, we, we wouldn't be able to do it because uh, um, they don't have the kind of foresight that enables them to act, at least Hobbes thinks they don't, let's assume they don't, have the kind of foresight that enables them to act with a view to the possibility of rewards and punishments in the future. Right, so like you can, you know, well, you can't really tell them. That's part of the problem, right? You could try to tell them if you do do this, you know, or else I'll punish you, but they can't really take that into account. So you couldn't make them into a commonwealth. So it's going to be important exactly what kind of motions go on inside human brains that makes them rational. Um, um, it's not enough just to have desires and illusions, but that's obviously necessary. Um, okay. Um, so, but uh, remember I said I was gonna talk about metaphysics and epistemology. So this, this is all metaphysics. Epistemology, so like epistemology is, you know, the study of, what, if anything, we know and how we know it, <laughs> how we can know it. <laughs> so, um, so you might think based on this, so like based on this picture, every thought we have is the decaying effect of some thing that acted on our sense organs. So, um, this is basically like the beginning of the empiricist theory of mind that's going to be so dominant in Britain moving forward. Um, as we teach in 100C. However, <laughs> this is a tricky point. Hobbes himself is not actually an empiricist. How can that be? Um, Well, um, he holds that um, all knowledge, properly speaking, or science, 
So science is the translation or a translation of episteme, which is the, not that Hobbes uses the word epistemology, this word is from the 19th century, but um, science is the translation of episteme, that epistemology is about, scientia in Latin. Right, so in science or knowledge, properly speaking, Hobbes holds um, uh, as opposed to um, mere prudence or experience. Science, properly speaking, is not based on experience. It's based on reasoning from definitions. Um, from definitions and not from definitions and axioms, but just from definitions. So everything that we um, know, properly speaking, we know because we know the meaning of certain words and we can conclude from the meaning of those words that other words must apply. So this is that's not empiricism, that's rationalism. Right, so Hobbes is a rationalist. Um, and, um, right, so here, this is a passage from uh, chapter 12, section eight. So chapter 12 actually was not part of the assigned reading for today, um, but uh, nevertheless, I'm gonna read this. This is on page 65. Um, um, oh, no, it's up here. Okay. Um, men that know not what it is that we call causing, that is, almost all men. So what is it that we call causing? Hobbes says that we say that one thing is the cause of another when we can conclude from the definition of one thing that another must follow. So it's always true by definition or as Kant would say, analytic. So um, uh, this, but this, I mean, but this is also, for example, the way Spinoza defines causing. It's again, it's definitely rationalist, not empiricist. So men that know not what it is we call causing, that is almost all men, have no other rule to guess by, but by observing and remembering what they have seen to perceive the like effect at some other time or times before. Without seeing between the antecedent and subsequent even event any dependence or connection at all. Right, so he's saying people who don't have science the way he does, the way Locke, the way Hobbes does, people who don't have science and don't know what reasoning really is, what are they forced to rely on in order to determine the causes of things or predict what will happen in the future? They have nothing to go by but their experience, which is not a very good guide, <laughs> right? So, in, so once again, you see he's definitely not an empiricist. She thinks experience doesn't provide knowledge, but only kind of guessing. Okay, I mean, that's going to be important. I guess it's important in various ways, but it's especially important because Hobbes is setting us on notice that he thinks that definitions are super important. Um, and he goes to a lot of trouble to define things. So it's worth paying attention to his definitions. I have a question. Yes. Um, having just taken the rationalists and done Spinoza and Descartes, yeah. um, I haven't done the empiricist class yet, but having a tiny bit of knowledge about it, saying that he's more of a rationalist, not an empiricist, but he also disagrees, especially in con con context of substance and atheism versus uh, uh, belief in God and so forth, uh, especially when it comes to Spinoza and substance. Um, is it fair to say that it's possible that he falls in kind of a middle ground where he doesn't have to be either one or the other? It's not necessarily 
as we might politically put it in nowadays terms in America, Democrat or Republican, red or blue, he might not be either or, but he's some kind of a bridge. Well, I think, you know, that's kind of a good analogy because Democrat and Republican, like, kind of refers to a cluster of views that, you know, um, it's not always obvious why just those things should go together, right? Like why the world should be divided just those ways. So like, I think, you know, you could use rationalist empiricists that way, right? To mean just like two kind of cultural groups of philosophers who sort of agree on a lot of things. Um, but, uh, and in that case, yeah, you might want to say he doesn't really fit in either one. But I think that if you if you wanted to be more strict about it and separate out these as metaphysical positions from this as an epistemological position, I think the distinction between empiricism and rationalism, strictly speaking, is an epistemological difference, right? The question is, what is knowledge based on? Is it based on experience or reason? Um, and as far as that goes, I've just been showing that Hobbes is pretty unequivocal. Knowledge is based on reason, not experience. So I think that, you know, again, using rationalists and empiricists not as kind of party labels, but as like strictly as descriptions of epistemological positions, I think you would have to say, no, he's definitely a rationalist and he's not an empiricist. Even though he disagrees, look, I mean, it's not like uh, Locke and Barclay are, or I mean, even Hume to the extent that he has a strict opinion about this, right? It's not as if those people are materialists either. Um, well, you said you haven't taken the empiricist course yet, but- <laughs> Right, no, exactly. So thank, thank you so much, Professor, I appreciate it. Okay, but yeah, so, um, all right. Uh, yeah, so I was just I was just saying that I mean uh, well I mean first that's it's important first of all because it's interesting that you know things that you you might think would go together don't necessarily go together. Having this whole theory where every every thought that we have originates in sense doesn't necessarily translate to being empiricist. But um, but also as I said it's it's important because. He's putting us on notice that definitions are important. And I think maybe even more than that, he's putting us on notice that he knows a lot of people don't pay, pay attention to definitions and don't realize how important they are. So um, a certain kind of reader who doesn't pay attention to def definitions is going to misunderstand him. And he may be uh, um, counting on that. But we don't want to be that kind of reader, right? We want to understand it. So that's we have to pay attention to the definitions. Right. So um, all right, that was all I wanted to say. Or I erased that list, but that was all I wanted to say about uh, Hobbes metaphysics and epistemology. Are there more questions about that before I go on? Um, so um so the other thing I said that I definitely wanted to get to is the definition of will and power. Um, so but actually, before I get to will or power, I should discuss what he says about good. So um, this is chapter six, paragraph seven on page 28. Whatsoever is the object of any man's appetite or desire, that is it which, for he, which he for his part calleth good. Right, so this is moral relativism. And it's a, so moral relativism means that good in the moral sense, if there's another sense, <laughs> good in the moral sense is um, um, uh, that when I say something's good, you have to say, yeah, you have to ask, 
like relative to what? Right, so like if I say something is big, I don't normally say what in relation to what I'm calling it big, but you have to understand. Otherwise, you know, I can say like, oh, this mountain isn't big. And then I can say, oh, this tree is big. And you say, how could that be? This is bigger than this. But of course, when I say this is big, I mean, it's big compared to relative to the standard for mountains. And when I said, this is big, I meant it's big relative to the standard for trees, right? So there was that suppressed relative that I wasn't explicitly stating. But if you don't understand it, you'll, you'll, you, you might think there's a contradiction where there isn't, right? So moral relativism says that the word good is like that. You have to say relative to what? And then there's different forms of moral relativism depending on what kind of relation you think that you really need to supply. So Hobbes is saying that um, that this is like I guess is egotistical moral relativism that what you have to supply is good for whom according to who right so again I read I read this one more time whatsoever is the object of any man's appetite or desire. That is it which he, for his part, call, part, calleth good, right? So the word good means, when I say it, the object of my desire or appetite. And the word good, when you say it, means the object of your desire or appetite. And if we just ask, like, you know, uh impersonally is this good or not um we have to somehow supply the necessary relation to decide right well good is it because to say it's good means it's the opposite of desire or appetite we have to we have to supply whose desire or appetite before we can decide if it's good or not yeah doesn't that mean one man's good to be one man's evil Yes, but it means that there's no contradiction, right? So just like, you know, that it's not a contradiction to say the tree is big and the mountain is not big because there's different standards here, right? If I say, you know, X, like it will be good if so-and-so happens and you say it will be evil if so-and-so happens, we're not disagreeing with each other because I mean, it's, I desire for so-and-so to happen, and you mean I don't desire for so-and-so to happen, and those are perfectly consistent with each other. Right. So, um, um, right, so Hobbes says this explicitly um, in the next sentence. For these words of good, evil, and contemptible, contemptible, as he uses it, means like not worthy of either desire or aversion. Like, so anyway, for these words of good, evil, and contemptible are ever used with relation to the person that useth them. There being nothing simply and absolutely so. Right, so there is, since there is nothing or at least almost nothing that we all desire or that we all feel an aversion to, there is nothing or almost nothing that can be called absolutely good or absolutely evil. Now, I mean, you might think there's a lot of exceptions to that, like we all desire water or air or whatever, but um, we don't really desire the same thing in those cases. Right? When I say I desire water, I mean I desire for me to have water. <laughs> when you say I desire water, you mean I just you mean you desire for you to have water. Now it's true, you might um, for various reasons desire for me to have water too. Um, but uh, you know that's a that's a different desire. That's not your desire for water. <laughs> right. So um 
So even though in, you know we all desire water, that's not a common desire to everyone. The common desire to everyone would have to be something that um, we all desire together, not just for ourselves. And later on, he's going to argue that there is one thing like that. And the one thing that's like that is peace, right? So that's that's going to be the key to what is supposed to get the Commonwealth going. Okay, but um, but uh, for now, the important thing is so sometimes Hobbes will talk as if good and evil were absolute terms, right? Absolute is the opposite of relative. We'll talk as if they were absolute terms, but you always have to keep in mind that according to him, they're really relative terms and you have to ask good for evil. Yeah. I'm just wondering, is it like, would it be inaccurate to call it like egocentric relativism instead of egotistical? Or yeah, maybe egocentric is better. I'm not sure that's the right word. Egocentric, egotistic, egotistical, egoist. Yeah, I don't know, something like that. Anyway, <laughs> okay. Um, Right, this is a post, you know, there's other forms of moral relativism, like um, cultural relativism, which is um, um, close to Locke's point of view, actually. But right, where you say that whether it's, you know, when you ask whether something is good or evil, you have to say in what culture. Um, all right, um, and there's plenty of other, I mean, Locke's, no, never mind, I'm not going to get to the that way. Okay, so um, okay, so that's what good is, and then um, so um, since by definition good is the object of desire or aversion. Yes. Yeah, I have a question. Just like clarification. Um, so Hobbes says like something like when you say something is good it has to be for someone or something but if you're just talking about like in general is, would you say that thing is not good because you're not saying it's good for someone or something does that make sense um well it's you know it would be kind of like saying something is big without any standard so we don't we don't really know what you mean does that does that make sense I guess, like, I can say, like, um, mm, like, there's a piece of trash, like, on the ground, and I pick it up, and I think, oh, it's good, I pick up the trash, but it's not necessarily good for him or good for somebody else, it's just good that I pick up the trash, so would Hobbes say that's good, you know, like, it's not really good for someone? Well, you know, so you desired to pick up the trash, and that's why you did it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so at least at that moment, it was apparent good to you. Okay. Um, that's that's the short answer, but you know, I mean, the longer answer of like, aren't I picking up? Isn't the reason for my desire? Doesn't it have to do with everyone else somehow? Um, so I mean. Uh, um it does uh or it might and Hobbes doesn't deny that that some of the objects of my desire and aversion are are like things I want for other people um uh, but part of the problem of setting up the commonwealth is going to be to make sure that there's like reliable desires of aver and aversions like that that everyone has right so that we're not just you know, relying on people, someone being in a good mood <laughs> to help. Um, uh, does that does that help us? Yeah. I mean, there's a story about Hobbes. Um, forgetting the name of the guy who wrote this book, but it's a book like basically of stories about famous people from this period, and the, who he knew. And the story about Hobbes that. He was walking with someone and he saw like a beggar and he gave them some money. And the person said to, to him, you know, like, well, why would you do that unless you believe that those like divine reward and punishment? 
And Hobbes said, um, well, uh, his, like, um, I found his misery distressing. And so in order to relieve my distress, I gave him some money. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, I mean, uh, uh, it was his desire. It was Hobbes' desire for himself to help this person, is what he's saying. Yeah. So, so he doesn't believe in the idea of like good in it, in in and for itself in like the Kantian sense. Um. Yeah. Certainly. Well, I mean, uh, it's complicated. I mean, so it's probably better to answer that after you read Rousseau. Kant said Rousseau was like Newton in the moral world. So. <laughs> but because it's you know because ultimately it's not that. You know, that one exception Hobbes has of peace is somehow related to the categorical mm -hmm. imperative. But yeah, it's but it's more complicated than that. Okay. Okay. Um so uh um so um so what does it mean? What is deliberation? That is what does it mean that we decide what to do? So, because, I mean, you know, remember, it works like this. A, a desire is a little motion inside my brain. It's a little motion that somehow is aimed at obtaining a certain thing or getting a certain thing to happen. Um, and you know the fact that it's aimed at that is what makes that me call that thing good. And um, it's also what makes me do something that will get that thing or cause it to happen. Right? So in other words, when I call the thing good, I mean I'm disposed to get it. Um, so what's going on when I'm not sure what to do? Professor. Yes. If I may, to go back to what my colleague mentioned about picking up the trash. Yes. Is it possible that, that first and foremost, maybe we do have a, an initial inclination in, in ourselves that this is what's good and bad, and so we pick it up because we think it's good? But also, going back to all of your earlier part of the um, lesson, that um, it could also be an influence of the brain or the sovereign that has reached out and said, this is what is a good thing to do for the entire nation, for the entire body. Yeah, well, like I said, part of the, what, the, the problem of setting up the Commonwealth will be to, you know, um, make people act in such a way that they reliably in such a way that they can trust each other to be peaceful. Now, I mean, picking up a piece of trash, uh, you know, I don't know if maybe in Singapore or something, there are rewards and punishments connected to that. <laughs> it could be enforced. Uh, so, I mean, it certainly could work that way. Um, uh, but, I guess the point I was making is like, I think, again, Hobbes doesn't deny, as in that story of Hobbes and the beggar, where there was like, there was no reward or punishment proposed to him. Hobbes, Hobbes doesn't deny that we, so to speak, directly desire good or bad things for other people. Um, it's just, uh, um, that kind of depends on your nature and your mood and all kinds of stuff. It's, you couldn't build a society that way. Is that so? I think I'm basically agreeing with you, sort of. Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, all right. So, um, so what it can't be, what deliberation can't be, is that. I'm kind of looking over my desires and aversions and, and like seeing which ones are good and which ones aren't. <laughs> right? Like comparing them to some 
other standards, the rule of reason or some kind of like norm, right? A norm, literally speaking, is a piece of equipment that was kind of like this that you use to determine whether an angle is right. That's right. That's what a, a norma was. So, um, you know, or a rule. Right, which is a kind of piece of equipment that you use to tell whether a line is straight or right, as they also used to call that. Right. So, like, there, I, I don't. There's no like norm or rule I can compare my desires or aversions to, because whatever I desire, by definition, is what I would call good. Um. So what, so, and I mean, this would be kind of like, this is a kind of Aristotelian, what I just said is not Hobbes, would be a kind of Aristotelian picture of what deliberation is, like what rational decision-making is like. There's a rule of reason, and I'm trying to like impose it on my desires and aversions. Um, but uh, since there can't be any such things for Hobbes, what's going on here? And he says, what's going on here is that we're trying to balance our desires and aversions off each other. So, um, um, we're trying to get one of them to predominate long enough that we can act. <laughs> so deliberation is a series and the way it works basically is like, I have a desire for something, but then um, I foresee some more consequences of getting that thing. And when I foresee those other consequences, suddenly I find I have an aversion. Right? So, like, I'm thirsty, so I want to drink this water, but then, um, you know, we we'll go with that example. It's my water. What? It's my water. Yeah. That's a good, yeah, actually that's an excellent example, right? But, but then I realize that it's someone else's water and I foresee that they're gonna hit me over the head if I drink it, <laughs> right? So at first I had a desire to drink it, but then I foresee some more consequences and now I have an aversion to drinking it. But then perhaps I foresee some more consequences and I'm like, well, I can fight back and I'll win, you know, or whatever, you know? <laughs> So now, and, and that will increase my reputation and whatever, right? So now I again have a desire to drink it, right? Like I'll show, you know, I'll show him. <laughs> so so um, that's what deliberation is. I'm going back and forth between desire and aversion as I try to foresee more and more consequences. Um, And Hobbes defines the will as the final desire or aversion in the process of deliberation. So, the, right, the process of the deliberate, the call, I guess, like, this is desire and this is aversion, so to speak. This goes on for a while. It never goes on to the point where I've looked at all the consequences. Right. I'm going to have to stop before that happens. I'm going to run out of time for my decision. But nevertheless, at some point, it's going to stop. And when it stops, I'll be in one of these stages. Like in this case, I, I stopped it on diversion and on aversion, right? Meaning I don't want it. And Hobbes says that final desire or aversion is what we call the will. Or it's what we call a volition. Um, but it usually, actually, he says it's what we call the will, right? So, meaning my will is whatever desire or aversion I have when I stop a process of deliberation. And that's the one, so that, you know, the kind of mechanical picture here is that as long as this is going on, there's something kind of moving back and forth. In Right? Or like, like things pushing against each other and oscillating one way or the other. 
And then that finally stops. And the one that is strongest at that moment is the one that then becomes amplified into a motion of the limb. So a voluntary action that is an action that proceeds from my will is an action that proceeds from the final desire or aversion in a process of deliberation. Um, okay. Um, that's everything I wanted to say about will. And now oops, I'm almost out of time. Power. That's unfortunate because power is really important. I guess I have to talk about power somewhat at the beginning next time, but I'll start right now by, by at least reading the definition of power. The definition of power, this is chapter 10, paragraph one. Power is the present means to obtain some future apparent good. Right, so power is something I can use to get something in the future that seems good to me. Now I think like it only seems good to me. What does that mean? Not that I might be wrong and it might really be bad. Um, in this, Right, right now in the sense that my desire might be a bad desire, because that's by definition impossible. Whatever I desire is what I call good. But I think it's merely an apparent good because I haven't foreseen all the consequences. <laughs> so I'm not sure I'm actually going to want this when the future comes. But I think I'm going to want it when the future comes. And so right now I want the means that will allow me to get it. Um, so, so, so it sounds at first, it sounds like power is a kind of secondary thing here, right? What I really want is something, let's say pleasure. He doesn't say that's always what I want, right? He doesn't say anything about pleasure is always what I want or something, but, but what I really want is something, let's say pleasure, um, and I want power in order to get it. But in fact, Hobbes says, it turns out that most of what people actually desire that is what most of what people actually call good is power. Um, so the future apparent good that I want this power in order to get is usually itself is just more power. Um, and uh, right, so in, in paragraph two of chapter 10, he says, power is in this point like to fame increasing as it proceeds or like the motion of heavy bodies, which the further they go, make still the more haste, right? It's like, or snowballing as we would say, right? It's like the more power you have, what you mostly use it to do is get more power. All right, so I guess I'll talk a little bit about why that is at the beginning next time. And that's the